My name is Nikolai, and I'm, uh, I'm mainly an investor now, but I also started a lot of companies, uh, helped a lot of companies, failed with many, succeeded with some. Um, and what we're trying to do with these, these events is try not only to have one-way teaching. So basically, the way we structured today is that I will start with 20 minutes of, of presentation on, I'm not saying theory, because that sounds so boring, so let's call it facts. So I would, over the next 15, 20 minutes, just try to give the intro to, to the topic of today, and that is basically, why do startups fail? Because, if this work, it did those. So these are the official statistics. And if you're a new founder, you should look into those, right? Because it's, it's quite scary. So this is after four years. And most of you know that to build a successful startup is not after four years. That is after seven, seven eight, nine, ten. So... No surprise that some industries are more riskier than ours, right? So if you're doing something with real estate or finance, insurance, well, 6 out of 10 is alive. If you do IT, okay, how many of you are working with IT? Which is very broad, right? So basically, 7, <laughs> well, yeah, I'll try to be optimistic. 4 out of 10 is still alive, right? It sounds better than 6 out of 10 is dead. Um, so that is facts. And you can say this is IT broadly, right? If we talk about this high risk, high reward thing, like many of us are looking for, I guess it will be even more. So the real question is, it's not really about, is, is startup risky? The real question should be, why does this happen? Um, and of course, you can get a lot of anecdotal evidence from people like me and Toa and other. And we'll most likely talk a lot, of, a lot of stuff. But if you should nail it down to a few, I would say I'll, I'll have it into these three circles. Well, sometimes it's simply impossible to get the technology to work. Maybe not as much when we talk about IT, but when we talk about any of you working with biotech, pharmaceutical development, stuff like that, it's basically that, you know, what it, I invented something in a pair to this. What is the chance that this will become a drug? It's like 0, 0.0 whatever. Not because there's no market for my anti-cancer drug, because we can't get the technology to work. Of course, it also happens in IT, but not as extreme. And, and then most of us will talk about the team. Yeah, there was a fantastic market there. In theory, we could build a technology, but the team sucked, right? And there's a lot of truth of that. I think many of us, when we look at about the failures we have done, most of the failures, at least I have done, has been in regards to team. So you have the wrong team members, including myself, at the wrong point in time, meaning that you do the wrong decisions. And then, of course, is there really a market for it? And that's also what we focus a lot about today. You know, just because I have a cool idea for something, it's not the same as a really a market for it, right? Oh, I want to have this app so you can check in or you can do whatever. Uh, yeah, and what is the chance that's really someone who wants to use it? And actually also someone that wants to pay for that. So this is sort of the anecdotal evidence you get over a beer when talking to people like me. So the interesting part, thing is, of course, are there any real data out there? And I think if I should mention one thing that is at least the best I've found, that is this Startup Genome Project. Uh, and this is interesting in a way that it's actually a commercial business who said to all startups, let's bench benchmark our data. If you give me your data, that is, how much money you raised, how many, many people you are, how many users you are, your revenue, whatever, into our database, we can benchmark you against the rest. Right? So we can actually see whether well, your customer acquisition cost is higher or lower versus in the industry, whether you are raised at an, an evaluation that is higher or lower in the industry. And this is not only for 10 companies. This is based upon several thousands of companies. Of course, the disclaimer is here that it's in the U.S., and it's mainly IT companies. But since many of you are IT companies, and I will say there's not that big a difference. So if you look at those data, there's actually quite some interesting, I'll say, facts. Um, and it's actually true, what we all say, and that is that you need to have a balanced team. And balanced team here is you need to have someone who can sell and someone who can build, or how they say it, a technical co-founder, a commercial co-founder. And in, in short, they're just more successful, right? Uh, they have more users, they raise money, blah, blah, blah. 
Of course, we're now in fear that it also means that they are more successful in the end, which I think it will be, right? So thank God that this is true. And I can say one thing. When having to impress early stage investors, that's not, you know, you need to have both sides of the, of the team. If you go to early stage investors, or most of us, and say, hey, we only have one side, you know, the classic thing will be, I meet university spinouts with fantastic technology. We have invented this. How are you going to sell it? We don't know. And if you become a PhD in some nerdy stuff, that's most likely the reason why you become a PhD in that. And that is most likely because you don't like to talk with people in the phone. Right. Well, but you also have the other side, right? You know, the good salespeople I know, could they code anything? No, right? So you need two sides of the brain. Um, and, and then, well, it just takes a long time, right? I don't know about you, but the startups I see um, which are successful, they're successful after plus seven years. Tor was out of his company after 12, 13 years or something like that. Uh, my first exit was after eight years. Uh, it just takes time. And we all believe every time we go into a startup, we believe that, oh my God, it takes only one year this time. And all the business plans I see and Crystal see and whatever, they're all based on the assumption they will be rich in 18 months, right? And it never happens. At least not for me. Maybe I'm not good enough, but it never happens. Um, and of course, we always try to be smarter. You know how we, but innovation just takes time because innovation is about disrupt. Uh, you know, no, I'm not used disrupt. It's about destroying our stuff, right? So if you want to say, hey, let's digitalize this industry, that also means there's a bunch of people here that are basically going to be killed, meaning losing their jobs, or have to change the way they do. Strangely enough, that takes time. So with that background, you know, it's just like, oh, one of the reasons why it takes time is because most of the things we believe are wrong. So we have this idea that I invented this, and all people, or it would especially be mid-sized companies in Germany that would buy it, right? And I can guess you, or I can uh, assure you that in five years, when they're sort of semi-successful and you ask them, they'll say, well, we changed the product name, we changed the pricing, we changed whatever, and it happens for all companies. And I basically just Google, you know, famous pivots, and it's quite fun, right, that, that Instagram actually had, had a name. What was it called before? <coughs> it's called Bourbon. And it was another app. And then they change it and it becomes Instagram, right? And most of the startups I'm in maybe didn't change it that radically, but it changed a lot. And the good thing is that you actually have here that, again, from the startup genome, that these startups that change their fundamental assumptions a few times are more successful. So building a successful startup is not about sticking to your original plan. It is to be flexible enough to see that, hey, this is different than we assumed. And it can, it's not always because that you are wrong, it's also because something else happens, right? This was actually true now, but suddenly a new trend is coming and you have to face that trend. Um, and then when you, when you talk to serial entrepreneurs, we always talk about experience and industry experience and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then when you look into the data, is this word of premature scaling that is the biggest killer of all startups. And that basically means that you are growing too fast. And then you say, well, you can't grow too fast, but we're not talking about growing too many customers. We're talking about all the rest. Basically, that you're growing your team, your marketing, or your product too fast. And when they looked into these data when in IT companies, it basically meant that that was the biggest killer of all the startups. Right? I'm not saying that the other things are unimportant. I'm just saying, you know, this is the most important thing. And it's really, really, really fun because the feeling I had, especially when I did my first startup, was that, oh, my God, it's about time. I can't be too slow because then the competition will kill me. Of course, I'm also afraid of competition still, but I'm more and more afraid of this, you know, because if you do this wrong, well, it's not competition, it's basically you sell the kill because you're doing stupid things because you're doing it too fast. If we, if we go into that a little bit about premature scaling, well, then the first way you can premature is basically a team, right? 
oh my god, since we can't be too slow, I need to hire a bunch of people. Because I need to scale this all over Europe before it's too, uh, too, um, too late. So I'm going to raise a lot of money and hire a bunch of people so I can do this big time. Of course, this is great if you really nail it. But it just turned out that a lot of companies, including myself, I've been in that com- such companies, where you're basically hiring a lot of people, and then after six months you said, oh my God, didn't really take off. And then you have 18 people on your payroll, right? You can't pivot when you have 18 people. So hiring too many people, hiring too many with fancy titles, instead of actually people that can do this stuff. Yes, you need those people, but you need those people after you reach your product market fit where you have proven your business. Um, and all this is driven by this, oh my God, we have to be fast, which we also should. But we also tend to do it on the marketing side. So not only are we hiring a lot of people, we are also saying, okay, how are I getting all these customers fast? Of course, I should do a lot of marketing. There's nothing wrong with doing a lot of marketing or PR or other activities, but if you do it too fast, you know, they don't really prove what you think you're doing. You basically end up with way too high acquisition costs. So yes, you get users, but they don't prove anything. So when you later on have burned all your money because you have the 18 people and have spent 500,000 on Facebook advertising and you come to the investor and say, hey, I now have 2,000 customers. That's great. And then when we look into the numbers, we find out you're paid a trillion dollars per customer, right? You still haven't proven anything because if you give me one million kroner, I can get any customer, right? So it's not about getting customers. It's about about getting the right customers at the right right price. And and the final thing, you then premature is, of course, the product. Um, it's actually a quite fun anecdote. I just put it with, with nine heads. You know. So the company that did premature scaling, they actually wrote three times more code than the rest, right? So the successful co- companies actually wrote less code. Is that ironic? So what we're talking about here is, of course, that we are out there, and since we are going to have these customers, they are, they are asking for all kinds of stuff, Right? And of course, I want to build it. So you want it in red, you want it in blue, and you want it in green, and I'm building it all. And this then sends up that I'm building a lot, but do you really want it? Do you really want to pay for it? So with all that being said, you know, when we talk about why startups fail and what to do, then we just have to learn with the fact that you can't figure it out from day one. We all believe, especially, uh, how many of you have a, have a degree, like, you know, like bachelor degree or master degree? Yeah. And we, include myself, we are the ones that have the biggest problem. Because we teach in school, so to say, that we can analyze anything from the library, right? So the market for IoT in Europe will be $2 trillion next year, right? So we sit, we sit there, at least that's the old way of, you know, the business planning perspective, which we still learn a lot in university. That basically means that we think we can understand it all from day one. And then, you know, when you go out there and actually meet the customers, you know, you just have to acknowledge that what you thought is most likely wrong. You can't do anything about it. Of course, you should, you should try to get it to do it fast. But, you know, I really rarely see startups, all the famous startups you see, also on this list, right? The 10 startups you had there. And you can actually go in and see how old are they. I saw Gomo, right? Is Gomo a great case? Yeah. When were the founders? 10 years ago, right? Is what do you have? Vivino? Well, I, I heard about their first product. It was not exactly, you know, fantastic, right? How many years are they in the room? You know, so it just takes time. So we are in this paradox where we have to, of course, have this passion for changing the world and do it fast, but just realize it takes time because we need to do this learning. And and don't be tempted to scale it too fast. You know, really, really. What I really like is I meet two or three or four persons who have this burning vision and they're really trying to understand it and nail it with a few customers because then we can still, you know, even if they're wrong, we have only four people on the payroll. We can fix that. You know, we, I can call a few friends and we can find some money and, and we'll save it. But when you have a fancy office and 18 people 
and a marketing person and a VP of product, it's really hard. So you, you need to go out and start testing these assumptions. And there's one reason why I haven't talked lean startup, because we all really sick and tired of that word, right? Because everything is about lean startup. But this is about lean startup. And then the big question is, of course, how to do it in real life. And the reason why we invited Tor is basically that Tor is say, I never read Lean Startup book, which is great. But he is Mr. Lean Startup. So when, when talking to Tor, at least the impression I get is, I think really that's the way you should do it. So that Tor was successful with his first company, LanguageWire, and now is successful with AudioYo. I think personally it's not a coincidence. And the fun thing is, when he started talking about LanguageWire no, uh, or AudioYo in the first days, I just thought, oh my God. I don't think that is sexy. And then suddenly after one year, I met Tor, and he just said, oh my God, now it's in our business and very successful. And I said, damn, right? So he nailed it again. So what we would like now is to invite Tor up and, and tell a little bit about his journey and, 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 and learnings from, from, from his startup. So welcome, Tor. Ja, jeg tror, du får en guide nu. Ja. Så er du 